So in this video, we're going to be talking about how to design a data warehousing system for a software platform. So data warehousing is essentially just a fancy term for taking data from a bunch of different sources and then transforming them in some way and loading them into one central data store that we can use to perform analysis on all of those sources at once. These sources could be anything from data within our application, our analytics data, or information from a CRM or other system. Having all of this data stored together in one data lake makes it really easy for us to aggregate and analyze all of this data as one. So before we dive into a solution, let's take a look at some requirements for our data warehousing system. In terms of functional requirements, we want our system to be able to pull data from multiple different sources within our system and aggregate them together. So these sources, again, could be things like databases or analytic services. We also want our system to be able to transform the data so that it's suitable for analysis. So the data coming in directly from these sources might not be in a very good format that's suitable for analyzing it. So we want some way to be able to transform that data and make it easier to query. And finally, we want to allow some sort of data analyst to be able to query the data intuitively, meaning they can use something like SQL, which they're familiar with, to be able to access that data. In terms of non-functional requirements, we want low latency in loading new data. So if something is added to our database in our system, we don't want it to take two weeks to appear in our data warehouse. We also want to make sure that our system scales to huge quantities of data. So if we have a massive multi-terabyte sharded database, we want to be able to still ingest and transform that data at scale. So the first step in designing this data warehousing system is going to be thinking about the actual sources of data that we have, where they are, and what we're using them for. So for this example, we're going to deal with two sources of data, and that's going to be an analytics service and our database for our software platform. Our analytics service is going to be some sort of managed system such as Amplitude or PostHog, which stores user interactions and page views and things like that that we'd log from our clients. This is going to be a cloud-based service, meaning that it doesn't have direct access to our systems that are stored in our data center, for example. The other major data source that we're going to think about is our database, and this is just going to be storing the point in time data for the state of our application. So this is just all of the transactional data that our system uses on a day to day basis to be able to function. But we can get a lot of information about our users and what they're doing based on this data. This data is point in time, meaning that it could be updated or changed, unlike our analytics service, which is time series, meaning that it's only being appended to as new data is added. And the other data is just historical log records. So let's first take a look at how to ingest data from our database. The simplest solution for this is to simply have a batch job that goes out to our database, pulls all the data, and then sends it out to our data lake. A data lake is somewhat synonymous to a blob storage system. It's really just any sort of system that's designed for holding unstructured data and can be optimized for storing huge amounts of such data. Some really good solutions for data lakes would be AWS's S3 or HDFS. Both of these solutions and all of the ones that are tangential to them will be very good at storing all of this data. We're calling this batch job in the middle an ETL, and ETL stands for Extract, Transform, Load. So in the context of this system, our ETL is extracting data from our database, transforming it so that it's ready for analysis, and then loading it into our data lake. This ETL could be as simple as a Python script, or it could be much, much more complex, as we'll see later in the video. If you want to learn more about concepts like ETL pipelines and data lakes, we have a full video on these concepts, as well as several other concepts in our Systems Fundamentals course on interviewpen.com. Check it out if you're curious. So this process here where we have a single worker that's designed to extract data from our database and load it into our data lake works very well functionally, but might run into some problems at scale. If we have a huge amount of data in our database, this ETL is going to be performing a lot of work and it might take too long for it to complete. This is going to affect our latency issue, meaning that it would take a very long time for all of our new data to be ingested. So to address this issue, we'll need to scale horizontally. A really easy way to scale an ETL pipeline horizontally is using something like Spark. Spark is a distributed data processing framework, and the way it's interacted with works a lot like Pandas if you're familiar with that Python library. But behind the scenes, whenever you run code in Spark, it'll actually deploy that code as a task to multiple machines in a Spark cluster. Each one of these machines can individually perform a piece of that work. So in this case, it would be pulling a subset of the data from the database, transforming it, and then loading it into the data lake. If we have several nodes in our Spark cluster working simultaneously, we can significantly improve the speed of our ETL process. Process. So in comparison to our previous approach, our batch job is now doing hardly any work by itself. It's simply sending it off to our Spark cluster so that multiple nodes can work on that process simultaneously. So now that we've figured out how to load data from our database at scale, let's dig a little bit deeper and think about what this process is actually doing with our data in our database. So we have a few options here when we're loading data. Remember that this process is going to be run multiple times. For example, let's say once every day. And we need some way to make sure that new data is included. One option is to simply load the entire data 
database every single day, and then keep a timestamp of when that data was loaded in our data lake. So if we're looking at our data lake and we want to query for the most recent data, we could just look at all of the records that are tagged with the most recent timestamp, and we'd essentially get a copy of our database at that time. The big advantage of this approach is that we keep all of the historical data. So if we want to do some analysis on historical data, we can easily get at that in our data warehouse. However, the drawback of this approach is redundancy. We're storing copies of data that hasn't changed every single day, and this will significantly increase both load on our ETL pipeline and storage costs inside our data lake. So another approach to mitigate the storage cost concern would be to simply drop the table in the data lake and then re-ingest the entire data set every time. So this means that the data in the data lake is always a current snapshot of the database, and we're not keeping any historical data. However, we're still loading in the entire database every single time, so our ETL pipeline is going to have to process and transform all of that data every single day. So the other option is to load data incrementally, meaning that if we're running this process every single day, we can only load the last day of data instead of the entire data set. So in order to do this, we need to track what data is being updated. So we'd have some updated at field in our database, and we'd change that field whenever the data is updated. Then we'd look for records that were updated at in the last day, and we could load in only those records. In order to make sure this still works in case the job runs at slightly different times between the two days, we'd actually want to load the last two days of data, not the last day. This will give us a little bit of buffer. If the record already exists in our database, we'd update it. And if it's a new record, we'd insert it. So this is where the word upsert comes from. This will significantly increase the speed of our ETL, but it comes at the cost of a little bit less stability. If the data is changed manually, for example, and the updated at field isn't changed, then our database and our data lake will become out of sync. Furthermore, if the job fails more than once, we could end up with spans of time that aren't accounted for in our data lake. So if we want to get really specific about making sure that there's no gaps in time, we need to also add an ingested at field to our database, and we need to set that field every time we do a new ingestion. So we'd only ingest data where ingested at is earlier than updated at, meaning that the data was updated after it was last ingested. This still has the problem of data being changed manually, but it does solve the problem of having gaps in time if our job fails. One really important thing to consider with this approach is that we now have to use transactions to make sure that this field is set atomically, and that if the job fails, we're not setting the ingested field when the data hasn't actually been ingested. So any one of these four options will work for certain use cases. However, none of them are perfect solutions. So if we really want a zero compromises solution for data ingestion, we're going to need to look at an approach that doesn't involve reading it directly from our database. A good approach here is to use a queue. So inside our application, whenever we're writing data to our database, we can be sure to also write it into some queue. So then we just need some way to get the data out of that queue, read it, and then ingest it into our data lake. We saw Spark being used for batch processing of data on distributed machines, and there's a similar solution for streaming data coming from a queue. We can use Apache Flink, and we can have a cluster of machines that are all reading from this queue and ingesting data into our data lake. Flink enables us to perform complex aggregations and transformations on data that's coming in in a streaming fashion rather than a batch fashion like Spark would see. So this is a very powerful tool that we can use to process data coming in from queues. So this solution is pretty good for ingesting data from within our application. Next, let's take a look at ingesting data from our analytics service. We're going to see a pretty similar solution where we have a queue and a Flink cluster that's processing the data in that queue and writing it into our data lake. However, in order to get between our analytics service and our queue, we have to introduce something else because our analytics service is a cloud-based solution that can't access our queue directly. A webhook is often something that can be used to bridge the gap. So we'd essentially launch an HTTP server, and our analytics service would call that HTTP server when any new data needs to be added. Our HTTP server would then take in that data from the analytics service and write it out to our queue. So this webhook handler here is really just an API that bridges the gap between our analytics service and our queue that's within our data center. Beyond that, everything works the same as before. Now, if we want to remove this middleman here of this webhook handler, we can do that by re-architecting our system slightly. If we use a cloud-based queue, our analytics service will actually be able to access that queue over the internet. So if we use something like Amazon's Kinesis data streams, certain analytics services will actually have native integrations with those systems, so they can actually write data directly to that queue. From there, we can use Flink as usual to process the data within that queue and write it into our data lake. So this reduces the complexity of the system, but we do have to make sure that we're using a cloud-based queue. So this solution works really well for ingesting data from our sources. So next up, let's take a look at transforming the data within our data lake. 
Now we could integrate these data transformations into our streaming pipelines where the data is being ingested, but we might also have some transformations that work better as batch jobs. So for these batch jobs, just like we saw with our batch ingestion, we're going to use Spark to distribute this process. So if we have some transformation that we want to perform on a schedule, we can have a batch job that spawns that as a task onto our Spark cluster, and our Spark cluster will now be reading from our data lake, transforming the data, and then writing it back into our data lake. It's worth noting that this process here is also an ETL pipeline. We're extracting data from our data lake, transforming it, and then loading it back into our data lake. This is a super scalable approach, but if we have a ton of different batch jobs that we all want to run on a schedule, we need some observability into what's succeeding and failing, and some ability to schedule these things consistently and monitor when they're happening. A great solution for this is a workflow orchestration service like Apache Airflow. Airflow has a nice dashboard that monitors all of these tasks that are running, and you can set up pipelines or DAGs that define which tasks are supposed to happen before and after which other tasks. Airflow will then handle spawning workers to run those tasks, and those workers can launch jobs onto our Spark cloud. From there, the process is the same where we're loading data from our data lake and processing it and loading it back in. So we now have our solutions for ingesting data into our data lake and for transforming the data within our data lake on a schedule. So the final piece of the puzzle here is looking at how our data analysts can actually interact with that data. Now our data analysts, of course, speak SQL, so we want some way for them to interact with our data using SQL. Now we saw earlier that Spark can be used to process data within our data lake, but it turns out Spark also has this nice feature called Spark SQL, which allows us to do those same transformations using plain SQL. So this part is actually really simple. Our data analysts can just send SQL queries out to our Spark cluster, and Spark SQL will handle distributing and sending that as a task out to multiple workers in our Spark cluster. Those workers will gather the data, do whatever transformation the, the SQL implies, and then send the data back out to our data analyst. So let's take a look at everything together now. We have our data ingestion over here on the left. We can see this is mostly consisting of queues and stream processing systems that ingest the data into our data lake. Once we have the data in there, Apache Airflow is going to spawn jobs that will send work out to our Spark cluster to download, transform, and reload data into our data lake. And finally, to actually look at all of that data, our data analyst can simply send SQL queries out to our Spark cluster, and that SQL query will be decomposed and processed in parallel, and the data can get sent back to the analyst. So this combination of all of these systems solves our problem really well and can scale to a huge amount of data. You'll see solutions that look a lot like this employed at a lot of companies that have multiple different sources of data and people that are responsible for analyzing all of that together. Now, because this is such a common solution and because it's so complicated, there's a lot of software as a service solutions that exist to do data warehousing for you. So let's take a look at how this would look if we use Snowflake. So Snowflake is a data warehouse. So it includes the data lake part of storing all of that data, and it also includes distributed processing to actually analyze all of that data efficiently. So first of all, our ingestion process becomes a lot simpler. So instead of having to use a distributed data processing system like Apache Flink, Snowflake is actually able to connect directly with our queue and load data from it by itself. For analytics service, we actually remove yet another step because a lot of analytics services have a native connector with Snowflake. So they'll be able to write data out to our Snowflake instance by themselves. So we don't need a distributed processing engine or even a queue. The data can just get written directly to Snowflake. Our transformation of data within Snowflake also becomes a lot easier because this can be done simply with SQL inside Snowflake. So instead of having a Spark cluster that performs these transformations, we can actually build and schedule these transformations inside Snowflake. So Snowflake has scheduled tasks where we can say that a certain SQL query is to run every day. And then Snowflake includes the tools to actually monitor that query and make sure that it's running correctly. And finally, our data analyst can simply send SQL queries directly to Snowflake over its web UI and get their data back. So using Snowflake certainly makes all of this a lot simpler, but it's interesting to think about the fact that all of these services that we talked about do exist in some regard inside Snowflake. So regardless of which solution you use, you now have some context to think about how these solutions actually work. If you enjoyed this video, you can find more content like this on interviewpen.com. We have tons of more in-depth system design and data structures and algorithms content for any skill level, along with a full coding environment and an AI teaching assistant. You can also join our Discord, where we're always available to answer any questions you might have. If you or a friend wants to master the fundamentals of software engineering, check us out at interviewpen.com.